Okay, it looks like everyone's uh, basically come in. So officially, uh, a good mid-afternoon, everyone, and welcome to uh, today's mid-afternoon masterclass as part of the University of Melbourne Science Festival as part of National Science Week. Uh, my name is Julia and I will be your host today. Um, before I begin, I want to acknowledge the traditional custodians of the lands on which we are all zooming in from. Uh, I'm on Wurundjeri land today, which is also where a lot of the university work is also undertaken. Um, I want to pay my respects to Elders past, present and emerging and extend that respect to all Indigenous people in the audience today. Uh, really importantly as well at this time of National Science Week, I also want to acknowledge and respect that Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islander people have been researching, learning and caring for this land for tens of thousands of years um, and so they are our first scientists. So, uh, mid-afternoon masterclass. Uh, this is one of a series of events. Uh, they are happening at 2 p.m. Uh, every day this week um, and is where you get the chance to hear directly from a Melbourne Uni academic um, working on interesting topics from a variety of different disciplines. Um, each session um, is just a quick 45 minutes. Uh, we'll have a short presentation and there'll always be time for Q&A at the end. Um, so today, uh, we will be calculating whale migration using mathematics medical modelling, which is all a wonderful mix of lots of different fascinating things. Um, and to talk on this topic, I would like to welcome Dr. Stuart Johnson. Hello, Stuart. How are you going? Hi, everyone. <laughs> Fantastic. Thank you so much for coming along. Um, I'm really excited to, to hear your talk. Stuart gave a little bit of a sneak peek of the presentation as we we're getting prepped today, and there was lots of wonderful videos. So I'm very excited. Um, before we begin, I do want to give a bit of a breakdown of everyone just to give um, uh, Stuart everyone just to let everyone know about your background. So Stuart is a DECA Research Fellow in uh, the School of Mathematics and Statistics here at the University of Melbourne. Um, uh, some background, so he graduated from Bachelor of Mathematics with honours from Queensland University of Technology or QUT from those um, in Queensland. Um, also a PhD in Mathematical Biology focused on mathematical models of collective cell behaviour um, and then some postdoc work focused on developing mathematical models to understand and design future medical treatment delivery options. The number of different ways you've, you've used mathematical models, Stuart, it's really, really fascinating. Um, and so obviously Stuart's now working on uh, navigating through, uh, in, uh, well, how the ability of organisms to navigate through environments in the presence of uncertainty and noise. So interesting. I'm really looking forward to hearing about it. Um, so before we jump in, um, I guess for our audience, Stuart, I'd love to hear from you what it is about all these topics and mathematical modelling that interests you so much. I think the best thing about mathematical modelling is you can apply it to all of these different things. I mean, this is, that's, from all the things you've mentioned, there's such a wide range of even sizes, mm. you know, very, very small um, delivery options for medicines to, you know, cells which are a bit bigger, and then all the way up to whales, which are massive. Um, and maths lets you connect all of those different things in you know, perhaps a way that you wouldn't have necessarily thought of. It's just kind yeah. of that freedom to look at all of these different types of problems and have these kind of common approaches, which is the math side of things. Yeah, it's, it's actually amazing how, uh, how the similarities that you might find between all of those different topics, like, while initially it might seem like they're very separate um, scientific fields. So, um, yeah, really fascinating and great to have a job that you love, but you have so much variety in it as well. Absolutely. Um, so cool. All right. So um, everyone out there, so we're just going to do a bit of housekeeping. Um, so obviously we are on Zoom and it's a Zoom webinar, so we can't hear or see you, but there are two ways that you can, I guess, engage and interact with us. So just to um, talk through that. So for those that haven't been on Zoom before, there's a little, um, if you sort of toggle your mouse, there's a big bar at the bottom and there's a Q&A function. Um, so if you go to, sorry, sorry, first of all, the chat function, chat function is what I want to go through first. So that is um, it, where you can write sort of comments throughout um, the presentation um, and also at the end of the presentation you can even run a bit of a clap 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 um, because I've got no doubt that everyone was going to would, would have loved to have given Stuart an applause at the end of the presentation um, so there's a number of different ways to do that um, as a bit of a practice um, and I guess for Stuart and I just to see where you're all zooming in from today um, what I'd love you all to do is to go down to that chat function, uh, click on it, make sure you have clicked the drop down menu. There's a little blue bar, just to make sure the drop down menu is gone, is um, uh, chosen for all panelists and attendees, just so we can all see um, your answer. And in the chat box, tell us where you're from. Tell us where you're zooming in from, whether it be your school or your suburb or your country. We've had some people from India and Indonesia yesterday, which was fantastic. Oh, India straight away. There you go. I love it. 
I don't know if you can say that as well, Stuart. So we've got Indonesia as well. Mm. Oh, Melbourne Uni Library right on campus. I love it. From Sydney, Warrnambool, Greensboro, Q, fantastic, Blackburn, um, at home in Melbourne, Western Districts, China, Thailand. Oh, all the international guests. I love this. This is very exciting. Newcastle, Melbourne, wonderful. Well, welcome every one of you um, and well done for uh, navigating the chat function. Um, the second thing I just want to let everyone know about is there's a Q&A function, which I did mention a little bit at the start. So there's another uh, tab at the bottom if you click that. Um, anytime throughout Stuart's presentation, if there's a really specific question that you'd love him to answer at the end, pop the question in there and we'll hopefully get to as many as possible once Stuart has finished his presentation. And that is it. That is the housekeeping. I will step back now um, and give the floor to Stuart. So uh, Stuart, thank you so much. Um, and uh, yeah, share your screen and away you go. Thank you so much. Right, does that come through? Yep, perfect. Great. Oh, thanks for the introduction there. Yeah, so as mentioned, I'm gonna spend a bit of time today talking about um, how whale migration may be affected by human created noise pollution and also a little bit about the roles that maths can play in helping us figure out this problem. So I thought I'd start off with a bit of a brief dive into our, uh, into our historical understanding of migration, which includes some pretty interesting ideas. So the picture on the left here is a picture of Aristotle, who's a famous, famed Greek philosopher you might've heard of. And to explain why he saw lots of robins in the winter and the spring, but none of those in the summer and the autumn, and then vice versa for the red star, Aristotle suggested that the red-breasted robin transmuted into a red star during the summer and then transmuted back into the winter. So this is an interesting and perhaps a little bit far-fetched idea. Um, it's an example of how science at the time was approached. People used inductive reasoning where you generalize based on what you saw. So his theory fit his observations, but you know, of course these days we have different explanations um, for the disappearance and reappearance of robins that also fit the data quite well. Um, another migration phenomena that led to some interesting or some pretty wild ideas is the um, migration pattern of swallows. So swallows disappear in the autumn and they reappear as the herald of spring. So it is worth pointing out that some ancient thinkers had some pretty accurate ideas of why this occurred. Uh, the Roman Pliny the Elder suggested that the swallows disappeared to pursue the warm weather, which is actually pretty good. Um, but due to Aristotle's academic authority, the prevailing wisdom for swallow migration became that swallows actually hibernated in the ground and also underwater during the winter, as was due to some you know, perhaps unreliable reports. And you can see in this um, old image here of some fishermen accidentally catching some swallows in their nets. So people attempted to prove this. Uh, these attempts had some pretty grisly results. One experiment placed some swallows inside an ice house in an attempt to mimic winter. This ice house also contained a small pond. So if this theory was correct, they would have seen all of the swallows uh, hibernate underwater to avoid the cold. Somewhat predictably, the swallows just froze to death. Not what you want. So the wild ideas about the swallows didn't stop there. Even in the 17th century, um, Charles Morton suggested that the swallows migrated to the moon. So this was probably hard to disprove with contemporary technology. Couldn't exactly zoom in with a telescope. Um, but he managed to, well, he reasoned that with reduced gravity and air resistance, swallows could perhaps fly, uh, fly up to 200 kilometers an hour, keep this up for a couple of months, spend a bit of time on the, on the moon while it was cold, and then come back when things warmed up a little bit. Yeah, so some of the more modern ideas about migration can be traced back to the discovery of this unfortunate stork, which is known as a file stork. Um, this, was, this stork was shot down in Northern Germany in the 19th century, but, it been, um, but was found to have been previously impaled by a spear. So apparently this um, being impaled was not enough to disrupt its ability to travel long distances. The spear was identified as being made of African wood, likely from somewhere in central of Africa, and this would have only been possible if the stork was able to fly or migrate thousands of kilometers. So this was a piece of direct evidence refuting some of those earlier wild assumptions that we had. Uh, in fact, these days we know that there are several long distance migration pathways for storks between Africa and Europe. Um, you can see one in the image here on the right where the storks fly up through Egypt and Turkey and then into Europe, though we also know that they can go through Morocco and then cross over into Spain to get into Europe. So it's not just storks. Um, these days we can use a variety of observational techniques, including GPS tracking, to examine these epic migrations for a large number of species of animals. So I think this is a lovely illustration of some of these long-distance migrations. Um, let's point out a couple of the 
I want to think are worth mentioning. So the annual migration of the monarch butterfly, which goes from Central America to North America, I think is particularly impressive. So these tiny butterflies, which you might have seen in your garden, uh, they undergo an annual migration about 5,000 kilometers each way. So despite their tiny size, they can go these massive distances by harnessing air currents and thermals. Uh, another fascinating example is the green sea turtle migration, which if you ever watched Finding Nemo, uh, you might remember that they use the East Australian current to help them travel. They actually travel vast distances each year to breeding grounds and then return. So today's talk, we are going to focus on whale migration. So let's get onto that. So this is some data collected by the Australian Antarctic program about the migratory routes of pygmy blue whales. So the whales were tagged off the coast of Western Australia, and we can now just watch them migrate from there towards Indonesia. So you can see that we started off with a lot of whales and then we're kind of watching them go north and then we lose the signal for a bunch of them. Some of them kind of pop in and out. And this does highlight the difficulty of gaining detailed information about the migration routes of whales. Uh, the ocean is a huge place. It does take quite a lot of time to find and then try and attach a GPS tracker to a whale. And then as you've seen, the trackers don't last forever. They might you know, run out of batteries. They might become dislodged. They might just break. So it is a um, big undertaking to try and get some of this data. So you might be wondering how whales are actually able to reliably travel such long distances. To us, the ocean really seems like a bit of a featureless, land, uh, featureless landscape. I know if I tried to swim from Perth to Indonesia, I'd definitely get lost. Um, so animals can use a range of navigational cues to work out where they are and where they need to go. So some of these cues are most relevant for long scale migrations. So things like celestial information to so the stars or changes in the magnetic field. These cues change over long distances, making them suitable for um, like the, the main phase of these migrations. Um, as, as you get, you know, as you travel a long distance, you can detect change in the magnetic field. But if you travel a short distance, that's not as obvious. So this means that as the animals get closer to where they want to go, these cues don't change quickly enough and you need to use different sources of information. So things like visual information, if you're looking out for a landmark, uh, olfactory information, the sense of, sense of smell, or things like chemical detection, they become more relevant for navigation as you get closer to where you want to go. So for a lot of whale species, it's still a bit of a mystery precisely how navigation occurs. Um, it's also worth mentioning that social communication can help uh, facilitate navigation. So if you're an experienced animal and you've done this migration before, you're able to communicate that with other individuals within your community who might be less experienced. And then the next time that you need to that community needs to migrate, those inexperienced individuals are a bit more experienced, and then they can help pass it on to newer individuals in the community. So with this idea of communication, I'm going to look a little bit at whale communication in the ocean. So there's a famous film in the 1950s that described under the water as the silent world. So this was a little bit misleading. Um, in reality, the ocean has never been silent. Sound propagation is actually very efficient in the water. So for example, Blue whale calls can be heard from over a thousand kilometers away, it's been estimated. So for us, that'd be like me yelling out in Melbourne and having a friend in either Hobart, Sydney or Adelaide be able to hear me, as you can see in this picture here. So the red dot is centered at Melbourne. The circle is you know, roughly a thousand kilometers in radius. And imagine yelling out and having everyone within that circle be able to hear you. So this is perhaps reality for the whales. But what this means in terms of navigation is that the whales can effectively be navigating as a group due to this massive communication range, even if for our perspective, they're quite separate. So, you know, from a visual perspective, they might not look like they're anywhere close to each other, but based on how far away from each other they can be and still be able to talk, they might still be in the same group. So this is an idea of an acoustic group. Um, so it's a little bit counterintuitive because we don't think you know, they look like they're far apart, but from their perspective, given they're able to communicate over that distance perfectly well, they may still be um, kind of functioning as a group. So the use of sound propagation in the ocean is both a blessing and a curse. So it does allow them, the whales to communicate over such long distances, but it does mean they are also vulnerable to noise pollution. So any sound in the ocean also shares the ability to propagate over long distances. And this means that the whales communications can be disrupted and distorted by these other sounds. So before there was significant human activity in what was referred to, or what we'll refer to as a pristine soundscape, you would have had underwater noise. It would have been driven by things like wind, rain, and waves at the surface of the ocean. You would have had noise from animals underneath the surface. And then depending on the topography of under 
sorry, of the topography under the water, that would influence how much the noise would be able to spread. But in more recent times, there are more and more sources of man-made or anthropogenic noise, uh, things like sonar from ships, drilling and seismic surveys associated with resource exploration, uh, exploration and then just the large amounts of noise associated with massive container ships that just take goods back and forth across the globe. So what this means is that whales have to be able to compete with this noise in order to communicate. Um, people have studied the rays in this ambient background noise level over the years, and what they've observed is somewhere between a 10 and a 20 percent decibel, sorry, a 10 and 10 to 20 decibel increase over the last 50 years, as you can see from this figure here on the left. This is now you know, 10 years out of date or so, so you'd expect the noise levels to have gone up a little bit more as more and more activity is present in the oceans. Uh, shipping traffic is also increasing year on year as more and more goods travel the globe. So the shipping noise is actually um, located to specific regions on the planet, or at least the larger sources of noise are. Um, this is not good news if you're a whale in the area, but it does mean that there are more quiet areas of the ocean compared to these shipping lanes. But in particular, the coast of Western Europe, down through the Mediterranean, uh, the now infamous Suez Canal, and then down through Indonesia over to China, all have very high levels of noise due to lots of shipping traffic. I guess the natural question here is how much this increase in ambient noise matters and what effect this has on the whales. So the frequency and noise levels that us as humans might find irritating or painful may impact whales differently. It might be better, it might be worse, but it's just not immediately obvious um, how those two things are related. So one thing we do know about increased um, ambient noise is known as the Lombard effect. So the Lombard effect is a fairly widespread phenomenon which describes the change in vocalization due to an increase in the ambient noise level. So think about how you might chat to a friend if you're just talking to them in a quiet room compared to how you might chat to that same friend if you were at a loud cocktail party, as you can see these whales are doing here. Uh, you might expect to have to speak a little bit louder, though you might not notice that until the next morning when you wake up with a bit of a sore throat. Um, but we do actually know that there are a range of changes in communication that occur as you are in a louder and louder, or as the background environment gets louder and louder. There's this expected increase in the volume or the sound intensity. We also get a change in the frequencies of your voice. Um, previously low frequencies can become high frequencies in an attempt to cut through that background noise. So this isn't actually just a human phenomenon. So we know this occurs in various bird species and bird species, as well as marine creatures that include dolphins and whales. I've got some data here. So this is for the amazingly named um, Boeing calls that minke whales give off. And this suggests that as the um, ambient noise level increases, you get a different number of calls and you also get a change in the source intensity. So the different colored lines here correspond to different background um, noise levels. So what this suggests is that the whales are actually actively trying to account for the increase in the ambient noise level. There's another study that suggests the whales try and shift to less, less complex and higher frequency calls. Uh, and again, in an attempt to communicate in the noise filled ocean, the higher frequency should allow the noise to cut through, sorry, should allow the call to cut through the noise a little bit better. Though the, the study also suggests that less information is being communicated in these calls, as it is the equivalent of yelling out across a crowded room. Uh, another issue with this increased level of ambient noise is that you can lose a lot of your communication range. So this is some data associated with minke whales, which in the in a pristine, pristine soundscape have been estimated to communicate over about 115 kilometers. But if you increase the background noise level by 20 decibels, which if you think back to that plot I showed you before is what we've seen over the last 40 or 50 years, um, you, this communication range drops to about 20 kilometers. That means your effective communication range, these yellow circles on these um, pictures here, are about 4% of the area as they were would have been in a pristine soundscape. So the image really shows how much of a drastic decrease this is. And imagine you had this population of whales which were able to communicate over these large distances in the first place, and now, they're, now this range is decreased. So there's kind of two choices they could make. They can either stay close together in order to maintain the contact and the ability to talk to each other, which they had in the past. And this means that they're able to, not able to explore th that space as well as they would have been able to before, because they're kind of being restricted to be clustered together. Alternatively, they could maintain their previous spacing and live a much more lonely existence because they aren't able to communicate over the same distances as they were previously. And this can then have knock-on effects in terms of navigation as they aren't able to communicate. So we are gonna see this reduced communication range where we have co-localization or things occurring in the same place 
between noise sources and in this case looking at minke whales. So we've got a particular focus on the North Sea here where we have seasonal aggregations of minke whales in the late summer months in the Northern Hemisphere, uh, particularly in the middle and north of the North Sea, as you can see from the sightings map here on the left. Um, so while North Sea is full of whales, it's also full of oil wells and shipping traffic. So the image up the top here um, shows the various natural gas and oil fields present in the North Sea, whereas the image on the bottom shows the shipping noise and yeah, shipping noise in the area. So the North Sea is actually one of the most active offshore, offshore oil fields in the world, and both the exploration and the extraction of the natural resources drive significant noise pollution. We also get a lot of shipping traffic in this area, um, particularly around the Norwegian coast and the English Channel, which again creates a large amount of noise, as you can see from the figure down the bottom here. So one final implication of these increases in ambient noise is that of mass strandings. So I do need to point out that the science here isn't completely settled, but there is evidence that suggests that a number of mass stranding events are linked to noise pollution phenomena. So I've just taken some screenshots from news articles uh, sadly, both of these occurred over the last year, and in both cases, over 100 whales died. Um, we know that an increase in ambient noise levels leads to high stress in the whales, and we also see noise avoidance behavior, where whales may not return to areas that now have a higher noise, even if it was a previously a region where there was lots of food and where they wanted to hang out, um, which can affect their ability to find sufficient food sources. It can push them away from kind of calm, safe areas for breeding grounds, and can push them into more dangerous areas where they are at risk at um, beaching themselves. So there are lots of different effects associated with noise. So, so far, you might really be thinking, well, what does maths actually have to do with any of this? So there's a great quote from a paper in the 70s saying that whales are reticent laboratory subjects. So basically what they're saying is you can't just get yourself a lab whale, run some experiments on it, and try and figure out whale behavior. In general, it's very difficult to experiment on whales. Some notable examples in the literature include trying to work out what sounds a whale can hear. And to do this, this required a brief capture and release of some beluga whales, which I imagine has some pretty challenging um, ethics applications there. And that's outside the logistical challenges of actually trying to catch whales. Uh, other experiments have been performed while attempting to rehabilitate beached whales. So this, of course, only produces a limited number of test subjects. And you, know, you have a limited time to do your experiments all of the while while you're trying to keep the whales alive and get them back into the ocean. It just means that it's generally very difficult. So this means a lot of the science is limited to observational studies. And even that's not that straightforward. The ocean is a big place. And while uh, whales are also big, the ocean is much, much bigger. So this is where maths really comes in. The mathematical models allow us to distill what we know about biology and behavior into a mathematical description. And once we've got that description, we can probe and analyze that and try and figure some things out. So once we're happy that the model gives us an accurate enough description of reality, which admittedly is often tricky, uh, we can start experimenting on the model by making changes that we would not be able to do in reality. So for example, we'd never be able to stop all shipping traffic to cut down on noise, but using a model, we can explore what might happen if that did actually occur. So the models we've used for this investigation are called agent-based models. So in these models, you have an agent, which you can think of here as a whale. And in this model, we need to prescribe rules about how that whale will behave. So in this case, our whales should be aware of certain things that we know they should be aware of. So they should be aware of the behavior of other nearby whales by some form of communication. They should be able to detect the local ambient noise. And they should also have some idea about the location they want to travel towards. So each of these pieces of information kind of feeds into our whale and then they inform a couple of rules that come out of the whale. So we want our whale to be able to swim and navigate, and we also want that whale to be able to communicate with other whales. So to build this into our model, we're gonna pick a movement rule, which allows our whales to preferentially move in the direction of a target location. So they have some idea of where to go. They should be able to travel in that direction. They might not always get it right, but on average, they will move in that direction. Our whales can also communicate, and in this, uh, in this model, this means that they have some kind of observational, you know, based on auditory communication. They've got some information about what other whales nearby might be doing, and in particular, the direction they might be traveling in. So this also feeds into our movement rule. So if we see a lot of whales going in one direction, our other whale probably thinks, okay, we should also go in that direction. Uh, the ambient noise will also affect both the quality and quantity of information received from other whales. So if it's louder, 
it makes sense that that whale can't see or can't communicate over such a large distance. And that means it can have fewer observations of other whales to rely on to inform where it should go. Um, so we could add plenty more rules here, you know, include things like feeding behavior, or you know, we know whales have quite a strong social structure within their groups. But the general rule of modeling is to keep it simple where possible and then build upon it as you go. Okay, so the specific movement rule that we put into this model is what's called a velocity jump random walk. So in a velocity jump random walk, our whales are going to move via a combination of what are called runs and tumbles. So a whale is going to select a direction, it's going to move or run in that direction for a certain amount of time, and then it's going to select a new direction, which is known as a tumble, and it's going to travel in that way. And we're going to repeat this process until it arrives at this target destination. So this picture here shows a schematic of this. So the whale is attempting to get towards this target but we can see that not all of the moves are taking that whale directly towards the target that does get there in the end. So what this represents is how much certainty or how much information the whale has about the location of the target. So if, we were, if this whale was very uncertain about where to go, the movement directions will be all over the place. They'll be quite close to random, um, just representing the fact that it doesn't really know where to go. But on the other hand, if it was very certain about where to go, these movement events will almost be in a straight line towards that target, representing it's like, okay, I really need to go in this direction, and then we'll successfully do that. So now we've got this idea of the whale knowing something about um, where to go, and we can then think back to that idea we had of using navigational cues, which we talked about earlier, and how animals use that to get from point A to point B. So depending on the cue that we believe our whale is using, we can construct a background navigational field, which is what this picture shows here. And this just tells us how much information a whale has at any point in space. So this field here represents something or it represents a field where our whales get more certain about where to go as they get closer to the target, which as we discussed before is maybe more relevant for things like visual or olfactory cues, but equally we could just flip this around um, so where they are more certain when they're further away and they get a little bit less certain as they get closer if we want to represent something like a geomagnetic or a celestial cue. So as I said, in this example, we see that the whales get more certain about where to go the closer they get. As you can see from the colors, the white gray whales on the left-hand side of the image uh, don't really know where to go. So if you looked at the movement that they were doing, it would be a bit more random, but the green whales closer to the target have more of an idea where to go, and their movement would be in much more of a straight line. So that background information field is all about the knowledge that an individual whale has. But as we've been talking about, navigation can be helped by communication with others that are migrating in the same direction. So we want something that makes our whales more or less certain based on the communication that they have with other whales nearby, even if we have the same amount of background information at any point like we do in the examples here. So let's consider the whales up in the top left, uh, the white whales in the circle there. The arrows indicate the direction the whales are traveling in. And if you look at them, they're all over the place. So imagine asking four of your friends, you want to travel somewhere and you're not sure where to go, you ask your mates, and they all point in completely different directions. You'd probably be really uncertain about where to go. But if you look down the bottom with the green whales in the circle, and you look at the directions that they're traveling in, they're all going in pretty much the same direction. So now you've asked four of your friends, they all point off to the right, you'd generally be pretty confident that the direction you want to move in is off to the right. So we want to capture this in our model. So we have, if we have less variation in the observed directions of other whales, we, want to be, we should be more certain about where to go and vice versa. Now, the other thing that we want to capture in the model is the increased certainty associated with having more observations. So if you ask 15 friends versus asking two friends, you're probably more likely to believe what comes out of the consensus of 15 of your friends compared to two of them, just because you have more observations. So you can start to see where the noise starts to kick in. So we know that the increase in ambient noise reduces communication range, which means you're less likely to see more whales, which in turn then makes you less certain because you just don't have that level of observation that you could have had if things were a bit more quiet. Um, though it is worth keeping in mind that noise can affect things in other ways, so it can distort the auditory communication. So what you think you're hearing, or you, you know, it's maybe it's a little bit difficult to hear, so you don't get quite the right information. Um, it can also make the detection of the navigational cues difficult. So to summarize this, there's kind of this three-step process that a whale has of deciding where to go in this model. So the whale thinks about where to go based on its own information, what it can see at that particular location. Uh, it can then also look around and see what other whales nearby are doing. And then the final step is to kind of aggregate all this information together, look at how much uncertainty there is in that process, and then kind of pick a direction that lines up with that. So putting that all together, 
Um, there's a couple of videos of what the simulations look like in a very simple test case. So we've got two simulations here. We've put the whales in a simple environment. It's kind of a constant level of information in the background. Uh, they just want to travel from the left to the right. The only difference between these two simulations is that uh, the ones on the left are able to communicate and the ones on the right kind of just migrating individually without the knowledge of what anyone else around them is doing. So let's watch them go. So we can see that it's much more efficient to be moving as part of a group because you're just that much less uncertain about where to go. You can see the more of the events in this straight line, whereas the individuals on the right are a bit more all over the place. Uh, you can see the one on the left is getting to the far side earlier. And we can also see the population tends to stick together a little bit better than the one on the right where they've just moved all over the place. So this is just a simple test, um, but it, it is something that you wouldn't be able to do by experimenting on whales short of putting earmuffs on the whales um, so that they aren't actually able to communicate, but it does highlight what models can do. Um, that is, of course, important to keep in mind the accuracy of models like this does depend on the assumptions that you make to construct the model in the first place. So in that example, we've looked at a very idealized um, background field where whales always have the same level of information about where to go. So realistic environments are unlikely to be this simple. There will be regions with reduced information you know, these could be regions with high levels of ambient noise, or if you're relying on visual cues, they could be you know, heavy cloud club, heavy cloud cover. So to generate some more realistic environments, we use techniques from procedure generation to come up with some um, more realistic environments. So these do have the fluctuations that we expect between regions of high information, regions of low information. Um, but crucially, what we've got is if you're in a high or low information area, it's likely that nearby areas will have a similar level of information. So just because the in reality, the environment won't change that quickly. So these procedural generation techniques used to be widely used in computer graphics and animation, though we definitely have better techniques for doing that these days. Um, and it's also pretty similar to procedural generation mechanisms that games like Minecraft have used. So we look at three different environments, and the only difference between these environments on the left here is how quickly the environment changes. Um, so we have a very fine structure at the top. We can see you've got, you know, um, more rapid changes from high information to low information compared to the core structure at the bottom. We've kind of got these very distinct regions of high information and low information. We then test how well our whales can navigate through these environments under different communication ranges. So you can consider these different communication ranges as traveling in different levels of um, ambient noise. So if you look at the second column, which shows how many whales have yet to reach their target after a certain time, um, we can see that communication plays a pretty big role. So whales, you can see other, you can see many other whales, you can see in the third column, actually do a much better job of traversing this environment. And basically why this is happening is that if you're traveling by yourself and you can't see what everyone else is doing, and you end up in one of these regions where you have no navigation information, or you don't know where to go, you essentially get lost and you start moving around at random. Uh, this is much more important for these course environments as you have much larger regions of um, low information, which means it takes a long time for you to find your way out of there by essentially luck. So for these type of regions where the um, role of communication plays a, sorry, the role of communication is very important. So as to why this is occurring, so basically what's happening is that the navigation ability essentially follows by an information, an information relay, a little bit like a game of telephone. So we find that even if whales can only see other whales who are also in these zero information regions, so you're lost and you're looking around, you can only see other whales who are also in this zero information region, but the whales further away from you, the whales that they in turn can see might be outside of this region where there's lots of information about where to go. So the information then just cascades from the outside inwards. Uh, you lose a little bit of detail each time until you reach that information who's kind of stuck in the middle of this low information region. So the message it gets might not be quite right, just like in the game of telephone, but it's definitely better than no information. Okay, so we've got now a little bit of an understanding about what's happening in our model. So let's return to this example of the North Sea, where we had both Mickey whales and a lot of oil fields. So now I've got some realistic terrain in terms of the land borders. Obviously our whales can't swim across uh, coastlines. We also know where the location of a bunch of oil rigs is. This is publicly available information, though it is still worth keeping in mind that this is a bit of a simplification. So we can estimate how much noise might spread from an oil rig, but we don't actually have the information about which rigs are active and when, nor precisely how much noise is being produced by them. But this does at least serve for an illustrative example. So the level of noise is shown in this middle picture here. So the light blue regions that you can see, uh, the locations of the oil rigs and the noise that have emanated out from them. 
Uh, we can also see some of the migration trajectories from the model. So the whales have moved along these or orange lines to the target. And so under the best assumptions we have, we find that there's about a 15% increase in the migration time, even for this relatively small amount of noise. So this might not actually sound like a lot, but if you consider this as 15% more time spent moving around, which means that you spent 15% more energy, which leaves less energy for things like breeding, and also leaves you less time for finding food sources in order to replenish your uh, energy supplies. So that was our first foray into a more realistic environment, but we can actually pull together a whole heap more information and data to make this a bit more realistic. So we can obtain information about the ocean currents and flows, which are dictating the migration patterns. We can also get information about global shipping patterns and the noise associated with that. So the image on the left here is showing some of the ocean currents around the North Sea. Um, bottom right, we have this shipping information that I showed you before. So mathematical models really shine here as it allows us to incorporate and synthesize all this published data together and try and pull it all together into one coherent model. Of course, this does rely on the hard work of a lot of other researchers who generated each of the pieces of this puzzle. And you really have to give credit to everyone for making this type of information publicly available, as this doesn't necessarily happen in every field of science. But it does mean that we are able to achieve greater things together as we are all working together in a certain sense. So putting all that information together, this is what our simulations look like at the moment. So the background here shows the level of shipping and wind noise. The light blue regions have more noise and the dark blue regions have less noise. The red arrows show the direction and the magnitude of the ocean currents. So let's put our whales into this environment and see and get them to navigate towards this target. So the whales on the left here, they're able to communicate unimpeded, just as it were in a pristine environment. And the whales on the right, are communicating and the communication range is based on the level of background noise at their location. So let's watch them go. So one the first thing to point out is there's quite different behavior between migration in quiet, no uh, quiet regions and noisy regions. So in the, at the moment they're in a quiet region, they're navigating quite effectively, but as the whales get close to their target, they have to get through this particularly noisy region of the ocean, particularly for the whales on the right. Um, we can then again see the effect of noise pollution. The whales start to move almost all over the place as they're not able to effectively communicate with each other, making navigation that little bit much more difficult. So there's still plenty of work to be done here. Um, we do want to incorporate things or behavior and data about food sources, just for one example, and we are hard at work at that. And this is just kind of showing you where we are at the moment. So I'll start to finish up here, but I'll leave you with a little bit of silver lining. Um, so due to the massive decrease in cruise ship traffic in Alaska over the last 18 months, we're actually seeing humpback whales returning to regions where they haven't been seen for quite a while. And when they're there, they're exhibiting much more complex calls than we've seen for a long time. So this is obviously a bit of a complicated issue given the circumstances in which the ambient noise has decreased, but this does at least show that the whale behavior seems to improve um, if the ocean is a little bit quieter than it has been of recent times. Um, just like to thank a couple of people before I finish up. So um, my collaborator, Professor Kevin Payne, who's based in Turin, was involved with a lot of this. I'd like to thank the government for funding this and also the science festival for giving me an opportunity to talk to everyone today. Um, so yeah, thank you for that. If you have any questions, just type them in the Q&A and I'll just leave you with a bit of information about tomorrow's mid-afternoon masterclass, which is more based on dark energy and I'm sure will be absolutely fascinating. <laughs> thank you so much, Stuart. Um, it's, it's fascinating and all those videos and simulations was just um, so interesting to watch and um, really fascinating to see uh, uh, I think a, a maths talk with um, very few numbers on screen. So it's been very, very interesting. Thank you so much. Um, if you want to maybe just uh, stop sharing your screen for a bit while we go through the Q&A, we might pop that back up right at the end so everyone knows what the next um, event's going to be tomorrow. But um, yeah, as Stuart said, um, please pop your questions into the Q&A. We've got um, oh, five or six minutes and uh, maybe a couple of extra minutes um, if uh, we can go over a little bit as well. Um, we actually had a, um, the first question was uh, from Liz um, about the measurable reduction in noise due to COVID changes, but you did touch on that um, towards the end, but it was um, it, it was fascinating. And do you know much more about sort of any more work that's been doing in that area in terms of the, the changes and the differences um, you sort of pre and post COVID and well, in mid COVID, I guess is the question there as well. Yeah, I'm, I'm aware that people are looking into it. I think it's probably a bit more of a long-term study and I guess we'll see the noise levels start to pick up again as you know the cruise industry starts taking off and yeah, I guess we'll see what happens. I'm not, yeah, not too on top of things in terms of things that have come out outside of the you know, few news articles saying that, yeah, we're looking at it, we're seeing these kind of almost immediate response. Mm. But in terms of what changes as things hopefully return to normality, 
over the next you know, few months, hopefully. Um, yeah. I guess we'll have to wait and see. Yeah, absolutely. Um, now, to, uh, onto Celine. So she was just um, asking, I guess, about the purposes and 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 the um, you know what we can gain from the knowledge of whale migration. Um, I guess can you talk on I guess the, the bigger picture about um, you know your work and and what how it can benefit um, you know the, the world and understanding what whale migration. So as you said, we're just trying to understand, I guess, the processes by which they actually achieve this. And then if we, if we can figure that out and then, you know, try and essentially make sure what we're doing is not overly impacting them if it can be avoided. So there have been you know, studies looking into you know, if you move the shipping lanes a little bit to not line up so much with no migration pathways, does that help things? You know, it obviously cuts down on the number of whales that are hit by ships. But given this sound propagation occurs over a large region, and you know, if you move the ship a couple of kilometers to the side, mm. the mm. noise probably decreases, but perhaps not by that much. So it's just trying to get an understanding and then yeah, what we're doing, how does it actually affect things? And if we know that, then we can look at what effect changes might have, and then we can perhaps identify changes that we could make mm. well with things, you know, things that we can actually do that would make a big difference. Yeah, yeah, absolutely. Um, there's another question as well about, I guess, um, thinking about whales as one organism that um, is being able to be um, uh, monitored, I guess, in this way. Do you know of other um, animals that are being or, or need to be monitored in this more simulated way? Or is it really because whales are so hard to be, um, as you said, we can't take a whale and chuck it in the lab and, <laughs> and um, study it? Um, do, do you, I guess the question is, do you know of other animals that are being studied in a similar way? Um. I mean, people, people do modeling of a lot of different types mm. of animals. I think whales are a little bit of a special case in the sense that they are quite compl complex socially animals, like very intelligent, mm. which makes things a little bit different. Mm. Um, and yeah, as, as you said, they're very difficult to observe directly. Whereas mm. something on land is much, once you've found something on land, it's a bit easier to follow. But if you found mm. a whale and it just dives under the water, well, it's probably disappeared unless mm. you have a guest tracker on it, right? Yeah. Um, and yeah, the size is another thing that makes things difficult. So, mm. so even sharks, which are relatively big, but not whale big. You can do some stuff in the lab on sharks. I've seen a study where people looked at the influence of the magnetic field on shark navigation. And essentially what they did is they got some juvenile sharks and they put them in a big enough tank and then just manipulated the magnetic field locally. Oh. And then found out, they looked at how they responded to it, which oh. is absolutely fascinating, but yeah. not something you can do with the whales just because they're no. that much bigger again. <laughs> no, you need a very big pool. <laughs> yeah. Um, Oh, very good. So um, I'd love to, I guess, go a little bit deeper about like, I guess, your your specific work in this and almost like a day to day idea, because I think this this is fascinating on a bigger scale. But like, what, what does a, a day in your job look like? And what are you using? And how are you creating these simulations? Um, I mean, it's probably less exciting than it sounds. I mean, I spend most of my time <laughs> sitting in front of a computer. Um, yeah. So all, all these simulations are typed up. I mean, it's all coding. I do a lot of my work in MATLAB, but equally you could use something like R or Python or Julia, any sort of, any sort of scientific computing language um, that would that would let you do the underlying mathematics. So yeah, so most of my days either sitting at a computer or, I mean, I think the most rewarding part is talking to experts who are in fields a little bit different to mine. So talking mm. to biologists, I've done a lot of work with cell biologists over the years. So talking to them about their experience and you know, they've obviously got a great understanding of what's going on. So being able to talk to all these different people who have these different backgrounds and different knowledge, mm. kind of sharing what they know, what I know, and trying to find that intersection where we can both help each other figure some things out. Yeah, I mean, I, I think the work that you're doing is such a great example of um, really um, productive collaboration um, with the different things that you can bring to the, um, these different sort of areas of work. So um, it's fantastic. Um, I've got a, a question from Adriana Zanka, and I believe, Adriana, I believe you mentioned you're from QUT, I think, right at the start. So um, QUT represent, I believe she said. Um, oh, maybe I'm <laughs> oh, oh, okay. Oh, maybe it was someone else. No, I'm um, anyway, the question was, what was the time scale of the movement in those last simulations? Um, that is a good question. You know. I definitely should have had off the top of my head. <laughs> um, I want to say about a month, but... I, yeah, that is definitely something I should have put either put on the figure or had in my head because I don't know. <laughs> Sorry, I will get an answer to you. No, 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 that's fine. So, um, so do you work uh, quite closely with those um, with the scientists? They're actually um, tagging the, the whales and 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 gathering this sort of data um, as well. And 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 how sort of how much can you talk to that process that they're working through? 
So at the moment, I mean, it's something I definitely want to do. This is not, I haven't been working in this space for a huge amount of time. Mm -hmm. And as I kind of alluded to, this community is very good about making data publicly available. So like a lot of whale tracking information is just, there was someone out on a ship and they recorded that they saw a whale at this time at this location. Uh. And this, you know, people just aggregate all of these types of sightings and that's how you get this information. So there is this ability to kind of work through the data without necessarily working with directly the people who have been measuring it, though I very much am um, keen to do that in the future. I just haven't, yeah, haven't had that chance yet. Mm, yeah, absolutely. Um, well, lots of time to do much more work. And I think I looked back, I'm so sorry, Adriana, I think it was, it was Jar Bat. I don't know who that was, but for some reason I got confused, but that's who's from QUT Maths represents. So there you go. You got, you got some of your group in there as well from your original um, uh, bachelor, I think, group. Um, okay, well, look, we're uh, almost one, uh, we're one minute over already, so I'll just I'll finish off with one final question. And I think you did touch a little bit on what's what's next, but um, do you maybe talk a little bit more about you know what's coming up in the next couple of months and next maybe six months in terms of your main focus and I guess where you're excited to sort of where to see the, the progress of this work. Yeah, so like I said, I'm trying to build in more detail into this model. So I think the kind of the location of the food sources and perhaps the communication of if one whale finds a food source and it is you know. A large one, whether mm. that um, impacts the pathways that they're taking because it's you know, it calls out and says, "Hey, there's a whole bunch of food here. It's worth you know stopping for a bit." Um, also, a, so in those last simulations, the whales were kind of being driven by those flow patterns. That was a mm. very passive response. Yeah, and a lot of animals actually have a kind of specific. Well, a lot of marine creatures like fish have a specific organ in them that allows them to detect the flow, and then they will move according to the flow that they're feeling. It's a little bit less clear how that works with whales, but kind of trying to figure out how they respond to flow because you don't want to be swimming against the tide, right? So yeah. if you can detect it, do you like go across it and then try and swim where you want to go? So trying to build in these kind of more realistic uh, responses to what's happening in the environment. Oh, fantastic. Oh, that's great. Well, um, I'll be talking to the organisers of Science Festival um, to see if we can get you back next week, next year, sorry, um, because that sounds fascinating. I'd love to hear more about it. Um, yeah. Wonderful. Well, um, on behalf of uh, everyone who is, there's so many comments in the chat, so hopefully you're reading this as well, Stuart. So there's a lot of appreciation for your talk today. So thank you so much um, for spending your time and for putting together such a, um, just the, the presentation was so clear and it had so many great diagrams. And honestly, my biggest takeaway is the whales with the party hats on. So I really appreciate <laughs> that. That's going to be my big memory from this L little presentation. Little known fact that they do yeah. enjoy cocktails. <laughs> yeah, very good. An well, extra little thanks for the opportunity. Everyone. Thanks everyone for coming along. Yeah, fantastic. All right. Well, before we go, I just want to let you know that obviously it's only the second day of uh, National Science Week. Well, the second day of Science Festival anyway. So um, please go over to the website um, and, and the, the link is in the chat as well. Um, there's lots more events happening, um, uh, including uh, the uh, mid-afternoon masterclasses for the rest of the week. Um, and tomorrow, as Stuart mentioned um, and showed the slide of, it's going to be all about dark matter which is something we've probably all heard about, um, but it's something that I'm sure we want to learn a lot more about. So what even is it? Um, how can you spot it? And why do we need to go a thousand meters underground um, to find out about it? So we'll learn about that tomorrow. Um, another point too, that this session has been recorded and all the sessions this week have been recorded and will be available on the uh, Faculty of Science YouTube channel as well. And anyone that's registered for this session will be sent the link also. So you can relive the joy of the whales in the party hats and all the wonderful simulations that Stuart showed us. Uh, great. Well, look, that's it. Thank you so much, Stuart. Thank you so much, everyone, for coming. Um, and have a great afternoon. Hey, everyone.